Hello everyone, I'm Justin Fraction here for TPS. These days we can't go more than a few weeks without an athlete getting into trouble for something awful they said on Twitter before they were famous, when they were young and dumb and apparently didn't realize that the things that you say on the internet can completely ruin your life one day. Villanova hero Dante DiVincenzo got into trouble for a bunch of insensitive tweets pretty much immediately after he helped the Wildcats in the national championship game. Buffalo Bills QB Josh Allen nearly saw his NFL career go up in flames 24 hours before the 2018 NFL Draft after fans dug up a bunch of old racist and homophobic tweets from his Wyoming days. And let's not forget the rash of Major League Baseball players getting busted for offensive old tweets in 2018. Brewers pitcher Josh Hader, Braves pitcher Sean Newcomb, national infielder Trey Turner, White Sox pitcher Michael Kopech. All of them were busted for racist, sexist, and homophobic tweets over a span of just six weeks. Of course, in the olden days, it wasn't quite so easy to get yourself labeled a racist or a homophobe. If you wanted people to hear your offensive beliefs, you really had to go out of your way to make that happen. One guy who always went the extra mile to be as offensive as possible was John Rocker. If you wanted to hear the former Atlanta Braves superstar say something racist or sexist or homophobic or xenophobic, all you had to do was ask him. He was always more than happy to oblige. Rocker shot to superstardom in 1999 at the age of 24 when he established himself as one of the best relievers in baseball. He was brash, he was cocky, he was good. But four years later, John Rocker's major league career was over, in large part because he simply could not keep his ignorant mouth shut. It truly is one of the most bizarre stories in the history of baseball, and today we're going to tell you about it. John Lee Rocker was born in Statesboro, Georgia, and grew up in Macon, just an hour and 15 minutes south of Atlanta. A 6'4", 210-pound southpaw, he was drafted by the Braves in the 18th round of the 1993 Major League Baseball draft. And after four years of toiling away in the minor leagues, Rocker got called up to the big league club in May of 1998. That season, at the age of 23, Rocker flashed signs of potential, striking out 42 batters in 38 innings out of the bullpen. But his sophomore campaign would be his breakout season. This, of course, was right in the middle of the Atlanta Braves' insane run of 14 consecutive division championships. The team had won 100 games in 1997 and 1998, and they would win 100 games again in 1999. The Braves built their dynasty on pitching. No other team scouted, developed, and stockpiled pitching talent like them. From 1991 to 1998, three different Braves pitchers, Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, and John Smoltz, won the Cy Young Award six times. Whether it was Greg Maddox, or Tom Glavin, or John Smoltz, or Kevin Millwood, or Denny Nagel, or Mark Wollers, or Steve Avery, or Pedro Bourbon, or Odalis Perez, the Braves always had good pitching. John Rocker, he was just the latest example of the Braves finding a diamond in the rough. When an injury sent Braves closer Kerry Leitenberg to the disabled list in 1999, the 24-year-old Rocker stepped up, took the reins, and never looked back. With a 95-mile-per-hour sinker and a filthy slider, Rocker struck out 104 batters in 72.1 innings of work in 1999, racking up 38 saves and a 2.49 ERA. Rocker didn't have the control of a Mariano Rivera or a Trevor Hoffman, but he was a strikeout machine, and as the Braves racked up a Major League Baseball best 103 wins, Rocker established himself as one of the most dominant relievers in Major League Baseball. By the end of the season, the Braves started blasting Twisted Sisters I Wanna Rock every time the guy came into the game. However, there was more to the John Rocker phenomenon than saves and strikeouts. As the 1999 season wore on, Rocker also established a reputation as one of the bad boys of baseball. When the Braves went on the road, Rocker would often get into arguments with opposing fans. This was especially true when the Braves visited their arch rivals, the New York Mets. At Shea Stadium, Rocker's arguments with fans tended to escalate pretty quickly. It was not uncommon to see him bust out some obscene phrases and gestures. Then they would throw things at him, and on at least one occasion, he spit at them. But Rocker didn't just agitate opposing fans. The tempestuous fireballer also got under the skin of opposing players. He talked trash to batters and stared them down with his bulging, maniacal eyes, then stomp around and pump his fist when he struck them out. By the time the Braves faced off against the Mets in the 1999 National League Championship Series, Rocker was such a sensation and his relationship with the New York baseball fans so combative that Sports Illustrated sent baseball writer Jeff Perlman to do a profile about him. After meeting Rocker during the 1999 NLCS and spending 20 minutes with him here, 15 minutes with them there, Perlman's impression was that the controversial Braves closer was simply misunderstood. 
Rocker came off as friendly and engaging in person. His teammates seemed to like him. His parents told sweet stories about what Rocker was like as a kid. As a result, the story Perlman ended up writing was, in his own words, a heartwarming tale of a small-town Georgia boy who made it in the big leagues. But that version of Perlman's Rocker profile never got published. After beating the Mets in the NLCS, the Braves were humiliated four games to zero by the New York Yankees in the World Series. Perlman's editor put the feel-good rocker piece on hold. If the Braves had not lost to the Yankees in the 1999 World Series, or if they had at least played halfway decent baseball, the world may not have heard about the real John Rocker. We would have read Perlman's original profile about the misunderstood Braves closer and thought, well, maybe things aren't always what they appeared. That's not what happened. About a month after the World Series, Perlman's editor at Sports Illustrated sent him to spend an afternoon with Rocker in Atlanta so he could gain some more insights and freshen up his profile. That afternoon in Atlanta ended up changing both their lives. Over the course of a few hours talking to Jeff Perlman, Rocker revealed himself to be a chauvinist, a racist, a homophobe, and a xenophobe, as well as just a plain old-fashioned a-hole. When the story was published in the December 27, 1999 issue of Sports Illustrated, it rocked the sports world. The promising Atlanta Braves pitcher had fired off one incredible, offensive, ignorant quote after another. Perhaps the most infamous quote was the one about why he hated New York and would never play there. I would retire first, Rocker said. It's the most hectic, nerve-wracking city. Imagine having to take the 7 train to the ballpark, looking like you're riding through Beirut next to some kid with purple hair, next to some queer with AIDS, right next to some dude who just got out of jail for the fourth time right next to some 20-year-old mom with four kids. It's depressing. The biggest thing I don't like about New York are the foreigners, Rocker continued. I'm not a very big fan of foreigners. You can walk an entire block in Times Square and not hear anybody speak English. Asians and Koreans and Vietnamese and Indians and Russians and Spanish people and everything up there. How the hell did they get in this country? However, those weren't the only mind-bogglingly offensive quotes in the Sports Illustrated piece. Rocker also called one of his black teammates a fat monkey, ranted to Perlman about how terrible Asian women are at driving, and offered up a rather perplexing theory about white athletes being treated unfairly compared to their black counterparts. Again, this was all in one interview. After the December 27th issue of Sports Illustrated hit newsstands, the backlash against John Rocker was instantaneous. Sports talk radio went into a frenzy. The New York tabloids went after Rocker like a pack of hyenas. Organizations representing minorities and the LGBTQ community and people fighting AIDS and HIV picketed outside of Turner Field. Late-night talk shows feasted on his stupidity. On Saturday Night Live, Will Ferrell lampooned Rocker with a spot-on impersonation on Weekend Update, referring to hecklers in the audience as homo-Mexicans and saying the Braves and white people rule. The Braves and white people rule! Yeah! That's right! But being the butt of jokes was the least of Rocker's problems. Not surprisingly, Major League Baseball didn't think his bigoted Sports Illustrated tirade was funny at all. The league ordered Rocker to undergo psychological evaluation under its employee assistance plan. Then Commissioner Bud Selig fined him $20,000 and suspended him for 73 days, all 45 days of 2000 spring training and the first 28 days of the 2000 regular season. The Players Union eventually got the fine reduced to $500 and the suspension to 14 games. But it was still the first time in the history of Major League Baseball that a player had been suspended for something he said. Eventually, John Rocker apologized for the horrible things in the infamous Sports Illustrated interview, but the damage could not be repaired. In every city the Braves visited during the 2000 season, Rocker was heckled and booed without mercy. In every city the Braves visited, reporters asked him about his vile comments. Eventually, the circus started to take a toll on Rocker's performance. In 2000, Rocker recorded a respectable 24 saves for the Atlanta Braves, striking out 77 batters in 53 innings. However, his control declined significantly. Rocker walked 48 batters during the 2000 season, up from 37 the year before, despite pitching 19 fewer innings. His ERA went from 2.49 to 2.89. Things just got worse and worse from there. In 2001, Rocker's ERA jumped to 3.09. Fed up with the distraction Rocker brought to the clubhouse, the Braves traded him to the Cleveland Indians where his ERA jumped to 5.45. In 2002, the Indians traded Rocker to the Texas Rangers. He appeared in just 30 games and posted an ERA of 6.66. That August, Rocker once again got into trouble with his big dumb mouth. According to employees and patrons at Breadwinner's Cafe and Bakery, a popular restaurant located in a predominantly gay neighborhood in Dallas, 
Rocker directed anti-gay comments at a male couple sitting at a nearby table. The waiter who served Rocker and his girlfriend that morning said baseball's biggest bigot called the couple fruitcakes as he got up to leave the restaurant. Two months later, Rocker was released by the Rangers. In 2003, he signed a free agent deal with the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, and in two appearances, he gave up one hit and three walks while recording only three outs. The Devil Rays subsequently released Rocker on June 27, 2003. He never pitched in the major leagues again. Four years after bursting onto the scene and establishing himself as one of the best relievers in baseball, Rocker's once promising career was over. It had been ruined by a closed mind and an open mouth. It's been 15 years since Rocker, now 43, has thrown a pitch in a Major League Baseball game. He hasn't mellowed out one bit. In 2006, he launched his so-called Speak English campaign, directed at people who had the audacity to come to America and not immediately learn how to speak American. In 2011, Rocker published a memoir, Rocker, Scars and Stripes, which he described as conservative Republican rantings written for the Bill O'Reilly's and Rush Limbaugh's of the world. From 2013 to 15, Rocker wrote incendiary op-eds for alt-right news site WorldNet Daily, offering up theories about leftist lunatics, the clueless American media, and President Obama's racial resentment. One of those pieces was entitled, What If Jameis Winston Was a White Lacrosse Player? You can probably guess the point he was trying to make in that one. For a while, Rocker was actually on Twitter, or at least people thought he was. An account with the handle at John Rocker popped up in 2014 and started dishing out vulgar insults left and right. A number of news outlets reported on Rocker's supposed Twitter rants with headlines like John Rocker up to his old tricks. The tweets certainly seem like they could have come from Rocker, but the account never did get an official blue check mark, and it's likely that it was all just a hoax. And that's just as well. John Rocker never needed Twitter to shock and offend people. Why well, start using Twitter now? Once again, I'm Justin Fraction, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We'll see you guys next time.